Good evening, everyone. My name is Don Ficken, and I'm part of a library telescope team that's been uh, working to promote the library telescope program uh, throughout the USA and actually throughout the world. A library telescope program is where a patron can check out a telescope from a book, just uh, from a library, just like a book. So we've been doing a monthly series. Uh, tonight's program is called Library Telescope Programs for Children. And uh, I want you to check out our Facebook page if you're not on Facebook. Uh, we have people on Zoom tonight and also on Facebook. So, and also at librarytelescope.org. That's our website and our Facebook page. Now, if you uh, happen to have some friends that were not able to attend tonight's meeting, or, or if you did not get to, to get to see last month's meeting, we are posting the uh, programs out on uh, Facebook, onto YouTube, and it's of course on Facebook as well. Our last month's program was called Fun at the Telescope. And that's where we talked about how to take photos, you photographs used in the telescope, using iPhones, things like that, and also some books and tools to prepare. And next month on March 17th, we've got uh, really kind of a new thing we're trying. We're going to talk with libraries. We have one in the state of New York and one in the state of Washington. We want them to share their experiences, of really what they've been doing with the program and how it's been successful with them and that type of thing. And so we're gonna have a fun time tonight. Uh, the way this will work is that I've got folks on Zoom and I have folks on Facebook. Uh, if you can just type your qu uh, questions on Zoom into the chat box or on into Facebook into the uh, comments, I'll be watching those as our speaker works along. And when she gets done, then what I'd like to do is uh, we'll open it up for questions. So our program will take about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll be looking for questions from you folks. So with that, um, you can see our, our link down there, by the way, the YouTube is the link that you can find on our homepage of our website if you're looking for some of the past videos. So, Gerilyn, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to stop share if you can go ahead and do your thing here. All righty then. Let's see if I can get this to work. And I'll here. let you introduce yourself. All righty. All right, do you see my screen? Yes, I can, thank you. All righty. Well, hi everybody. My name is Geraldine Ramirez and I'm the president of the Kansas Astronomical Observers. The Sky Puppy Program, what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is a fundamental program to get young kids exposed to astronomy. It is a great after school activity for about an hour each week at a local library that you can set up. And what I did is I made arrangements with the local library for a meeting space. And what I did is I posted a sign-up sheet at the library with a limited enrollment. And I have mentored seven children through this program this way. And it was quite fun and very rewarding. Now, of course, it is up to the mentor how many you will allow to enter or into your group. And as I later discovered, the smaller the group, the better. Now, this program is free for kids 10 and under, and they have to complete this program before their 11th birthday. There are no membership requirements, and you can make this into a really fun family activity. This program is sponsored by the Astronomical League in partnership with NASA's Space Science Education Consortium. There is a free workbook that is available and all you have to do is ask the program coordinator and he'll be glad to send it to you. The workbook includes several puzzles to help with the young sky puppy. There are 63 activities that must be completed to earn this award. 30% of the activities can be done in the library classroom environment, while 70% of the activities are out underneath the blanket of stars. Well, the classroom activities involved many fun, hands-on, critical thinking projects to give them that aha moment. And we, have, we explored the solar system and constellations with puzzles and games and videos. And here we are learning about the Earth's atmosphere, how it protects us from most radiation from our own sun and our galaxy, such as gamma rays and X-rays and how the Earth's magnetic field protects us from atomic particles from the sun. We also discovered why we put telescopes out in space so we can detect this radiation by getting above the atmosphere. <clears throat> well, using a whiteboard to practice drawing constellations using a variety of many different colors was a really big hit with the kids. 
and they are required to draw 15 of them. And they did a fabulous job of it too. And they also pointed out some major features of the constellations, such as a bright star or a galaxy, which is another requirement. Well, this is the second group of sky puppies drawing their constellations. And I have this assortment of constellation cards to use as reference to make their drawings from. And the cards, they also provided some information about the constellations. The bulk of what the kids were required to learn was how to ID constellations and to be able to locate them in the sky. There are 88 registered constellations by the International Astronomical Union, or the IAU. And roughly, you can see about 52 of them throughout the year from the Northern Hemisphere. Oops, got too carried away there. What, what I did is I downloaded a PDF file with all these constellations, and I made them into a four up document so that way I could print four to a page. And then I cut them out and laminated them for durability. And they were available as the whole deck of 88, or you could just get the 52 from the Northern Hemisphere. So I only printed the deck of 52. They are color coded for each season. There are 13 cards for each color, like a deck of playing cards. There's blue for winter, green for spring, yellow for summer, and red for fall. And these cards were really invaluable. And I do have another deck of cards that I have, and there's only 36 in them. And, uh, and it had more stats about the constellations. But you know what? The kids really like the homemade, homemade ones better. Well, here we are in my backyard searching for some deep sky objects with binoculars required for this program. There is a list of eight to choose from, and they have to be able to find five of them. And this young lady is pointing out a constellation she had drawn while in the classroom. And she used a laser pointer to trace it out for me in the sky. And they have to be able to point out the constellations in the sky, the ones that they have drawn. And this is where they learn some constellations set before they were able to point to them in the sky because they were simply not up yet because they are in the glare of the sun. And the caveat is that they have, they have to be able to see the ones that they draw. And this took them back to the drawing board. And this is where they made use of their planisphere as, as to what constellations were up the night that we were observing. And inside that workbook that I was telling you about, there is a DIY planisphere that you can cut out, assemble, and use. And each one of them had one of these to use. Well, the boys, they helped me collimate this here telescope before we used it. They had a lot of fun doing that. And using a planisphere and a moon phase chart help them with their observing nights. And this is something that we practice every time we had our class. And when we started the class, they knew what phase the moon was in and what constellations were up. And knowing the moon phase helped them understand if it was a good time for observing or not. Now, if you're observing the moon, that's good too. Well, I was really impressed with the kids when they did their oral presentations on a NASA robotic mission. And this was on the LCROSS mission. And these girls are sisters and they worked on their presentation together and they really did an awesome job. And they did their presentation on the OSIRIS-REx mission. Well, what I did is I kept a spreadsheet on the kids to keep track of where they were on their projects. They had to be able to draw 15 constellations and they had to locate those same 15 constellations and ID some major stars in those constellations. Find with binoculars, five deep space objects, and they can use the library telescope here too, if, the, if there's one available to them. Uh, they had to be able to ID and describe the Milky Way galaxy. They have to be able to locate Polaris, and they are required to draw a solar system object. And again, the library telescope comes in handy here as they have to draw either a crater on the moon or draw Jupiter's with its moons, and they could use that telescope. Well, then they are required to tell two mythical stories about some constellations. And what I did is I read to them a few stories and later they had to recite it back to me from their memory. And it was pretty fun to hear their interpretations. Then of course, their oral presentation on a NASA robotic mission. And all the kids knocked this one out of the park. I was really surprised and very impressed with their presentations. And then they had to learn how to keep logs of all their observations and how important it is. Um, there, is an, uh, there was an incident where it was overlooked on my part uh, on an observation that they had made. And because they had a log of it in their observations, 
um, I, it was ruled in their favor. And you know, this is something that you can incorporate into your training to kind of bring home that message of having accurate log reports. Well, there are two log sheets in, that come in that workbook that I told you about, and they're, but they're not enough to make all their log entries. So you're gonna have to make copies of these. And they do need to make a minimum of 22 log entries and the workbook only has space for eight of them. And this is the checklist and submission coupon. And it also validates the Sky Puppy's age. And you just add the completion date for each of the projects. The child verifies that they are 10 years old or younger, and then they are required to sign it. And then the mentor or parent, they sign it and they date it, validating the completion of all the required projects. Now, there is a space to provide an address where you want the certificate and pen to be sent to. And then once you fill it out, you send it to the program coordinator. And it is encouraged to fill out an online survey by both the child and the mentor or parent. And the website for both of these surveys are on the last page of that workbook or on the back side of this, uh, that uh, observing program submission coupon that you see here. Well, when all the kids graduated, what I did is I made them t-shirts with our KAO logo on them, the, the green t-shirt. And uh, it also had the word Sky Puppy across their back. And they were also awarded with their Sky Puppy certificate and pen. And here are the other two boys with their mother to the left of them after they earned their Sky Puppy award a year later. The Astronomical League publishes a quarterly magazine called The Reflector. And anyone who has completed this program will be listed in the next published issue as completing this program. How cool is that? Well, the two boys in my last class, well, they were right in the middle of the program when COVID-19 hit. And they were so close to completing the program. So we finished up the classroom projects uh, via Zoom. And then what, what I did is I went over to their home to complete the observing projects. And we were able to stay outside and social distance. So it really all worked out. And I did have one young man who was 11 years old when he began the program. Well, his younger brother did meet, meet the age requirements. So I went ahead and trained them both. The young man was fully aware that he would not qualify for the certificate and pen from the Astronomical League, but he did get one from me instead. And I also gave him a KAO logo lapel pen. He was pretty proud to receive this certificate and pen. And you know, I think it was because it was different than his younger brother. Well, it took around about a, like, something like 30 hours to complete the program with each of the kids. And this was all the classroom time and the observing time. And the observing time has to be flexible due to weather, the moon phase, and having the parents be, you know, be able to bring their kids over for some observing. Now, the parents, were they really enjoyed the program, and they even participated as well. And they, so they learned a lot, too. They were really great supporters of this program. And I did discover it was easier to work with fewer kids at a time, especially during the observing sessions. Uh, when each of them needed my attention when they were pointing out constellations or observing a deep sky object, the others had to wait their turn. And we were only out there for about an hour and that process really slowed down the more kids you have. So what I did is I got the parents involved and we organized a process which worked out pretty well. Well, I do have this fond memory that I'd like to share with you guys. Well, we were in class at the library. I have this 12 inch earth globe and a 3D printed illuminated three inch moon. They are to scale to each other in size. Well, what I did is I let the boys try to guess how far apart that they would be at this scale by handing them the moon. And then I asked them to go stand where they thought it would be. Well, they were really surprised to find out that they would have to be 30 feet apart at this scale. Well, their guess was underestimated by quite a bit. Well, when the boys' father came by to pick them up after their session, the boys, they sprang up to their feet and they showed their father this phenomenon. And it was so awesome that they did that. I just got such a big kick out of it. Well, what I did here is I used some media magic to create this image of my earth and moon using a green screen and video camera. And they are to scale in size in this image, but not in distance. They were sitting right next to each other. The moon was sitting on top of some these foam blocks to levitate it next to the earth. Using this green screen technology made the foam blocks appear not to be there. Did you know Luna is the fifth largest moon in our solar system? And the Earth is the fifth largest planet in our solar system? Well, that'll make you say, huh?
Well, the Sky Puppies, they made the local newspaper in two publications, and here they are side by side. And this, this also highlighted the library as well. And these five kids were my first Sky Puppy class. And I did start off with six kids, but uh, one of them had to do uh, drop out due to scheduling conflicts. There was even a write-up in the March 2020 issue of the Reflector publication on page five about these great kids. I thought writing a story for the Reflector would encourage others to mentor some future astronomers. So Sky Puppies is such a great program and a lot of fun. And I found that I got a lot out of it as well. So thank you very much. And I am available for questions. Well, Gerald, that was just, that was really awesome. Uh, I've really, I've done some programs uh, with children and it's so much fun. And frankly, I find it's almost as much fun to watch the parents get involved because they get so excited about it. And what is really cool is that the children, I hate to say it, but they kind of pick up sometimes faster than the parents do. And so they're showing the parents how to do things, which is really pretty neat. Yeah, so, that, that whole moon experience, you know, that little uh, setup that I had, it, I was just really, uh, I, I laughed. I just, I just couldn't stop laughing. Right. So uh, we are taking questions right now and we'll chat a little bit here. We'll be on here for about another 10 minutes or so. If you, so if you have questions, just something that's on your mind, just, just feel free to drop it if you're on Zoom into the chat area or if you're in uh, Facebook on the comments area. So Gerald, you mentioned something about the moon. And um, for those who are not really understanding how astronomy works, tell me, ex explain how the moon impacts what you get to see in the sky. It sounds like you were trying to worry about when the moon was what phase? Can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, sure there, Don. Um, what happens is when you're trying to, when you're looking at the moon, you want the phase of the moon to be available. So from like, you know, uh, like maybe first quarter to full moon or something like that, then it's the best time to look at the moon when you have where half of it's black and half of it's lit up, you know, where you have a terminator line. That's what they call a terminator line. But if you're looking at deep sky objects or really faint fuzzies that are light years away, um, you really don't want a moon up there because it's just going to wash out the sky. It's like trying to see fireflies when you got a great big old floodlight in your face. So another question. Um, so did you use the library telescope during these sessions or was this a daytime program, a nighttime program? How does this really work as far as the library telescope itself? Well, we did both. Uh, during the library sessions, we just did the classroom stuff to learn about uh, some stuff from before we got out into the night sky. And uh, I do have a telescope that's very similar to the library telescope. And so we kind of used that and they, they really, you know, had their hands on with doing that. And, you know, when they did the, they have to do binoculars, you know, to be able to find stuff with binoculars. But what I found what was challenging with that, you know, you say, okay, there's M42, go look at that with the binoculars. Well, how do you know that they saw it? Well, if you give them that little telescope and set it on a table and they point at it and then you can go stick your eyeball on it. Yep, yep that's it, you know, and then that way you could validate that that's what they found. Yeah, we actually found with binoculars that very often, uh, surprisingly, the children really don't know how to use binoculars. They really right. have a hard time acquiring something and even getting the focuses of the two different, uh, you know, as far as the glasses to be able to actually see something directly. Uh, in fact, well, yeah, my because mind, you have to be able to adjust it to your own vision. Yeah, uh, you know, and and know how to do that because there's a there's an ocular that's on the right eye, and you you adjust it um, after you adjust the the other one for your left eye. That's right. So let me ask you this now. Uh, let's say that when you do actually have a library telescope in use. Um, how, are the kids good at using the telescope? Is that something you have to show them as part of what you're doing with the Sky Puppy program? Is there a separate training around that? How does that work? Well, inside the Sky Puppy program, no, there isn't really uh, to learn how to use a telescope, but I go ahead and teach them that uh, because I feel like, you know, if they can get their hands on a telescope, this might, you know, uh, spawn some creativity with them as far as getting them interested in science and astronomy. And, uh, you know, and if they have available at, with them, you know, at the library to be able to check out a telescope, you know, and I, I have a telescope that they can um, use and they adapt very, very quickly. Uh, you just show them one time and they, they've got it. Yeah. So how many kids per telescope does that does it usually work out? I know that we've, I've kind of developed my own little ratio because I've done a lot of programs, but I'm kind of curious what you came up with as far as what you, your approach. 
Well, my first my first Sky Puppy class, I signed up six kids, and I thought that would be a nice low number, you know, to do this. But once I got them out in the night sky, because in the classroom it was fine, but once you get them out in the night sky, it was really difficult and challenging. Since you know, I would call up the parents, you know, and say, "Okay, we have a clear sky, can you come over?" And uh, so they they would, they would just jump right on over, and uh, and you know, sometimes it was a school night, and you know, and so you didn't really want to keep them up very late. And we always did this during the fall and winter months or yeah the yeah fall winter months because then it was nighttime earlier in the summertime it's really challenging because you're you have to really stay up really late but uh but, but to, to be able to do that and so i just uh have to make the kids wait you know to, for their turn while they're either looking through the binocular or through a telescope or pointing out a constellation with a laser pointer you know they have to wait their turn and so i found it was easier to do it with one or two kids so what we did is we kind of broke up in teams uh -huh. and, uh, you know, so then I, I would just call up, you know, like a couple of kids and have them come over. But what was interesting that the, the first six kids, most of them were related to each other. So it was, not, it was kind of interesting. Yeah, really. So now this, this age group that you're talking about, at least for the Sky Puppy program, you said it's through age 11. Is that right? To be able yes. to feel. They have to complete it before their 11th birthday. Right. right. So um, that, and I and I tried to get them, you know, I didn't want to go any younger than seven because I felt that. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Six was, I thought, was just a little too immature to kind of get the gist of this. So I felt seven was good enough. But the youngest I taught was eight. So, and, so what, they, and she took off really well. So what role do the parents play in this? Because I, at least my experience is that we, particularly when you get to some of the younger ones, you get, really have to have the parents sort of work with them a little bit to encourage their, some really pick it up really fast and others are shy and then others, yeah. you know, others will, you know, just not get it really. They just need some help. So, well, I think it, it really helped with the Sky Puppy when their parent was there because they, their parent was there. And because I didn't want to frighten them or anything like that. And, and so and it, because it was just for an hour, the parents were agreeable on doing this uh, and because they had the support, you know, with their parent. And uh, so that but the kids, they really uh, absorbed it quite a bit. And then they ended up starting to teach their parents. But there, I did not give them any type of homework, per se. But, you know, they really enjoyed it. And then when the parents started getting involved, because at first they would just I would provide a lawn chair for them so they could you know, sit and relax if they want to. If they want to be involved, they can. If they didn't, they, they could just sit there. And pretty soon, next next you know, they're, they're right up there seeing what's going on. Oh, I want to see, I want to see. And so when it became a family affair, that's when it really became a lot of fun. Yeah. So this looks like a really good candidate for like a summer reading program type of thing, you know, where the library is looking for things over the summer when children are out of school. Of course, they're out of school often too often these days, right? But have you used this for summer reading program for your library? I have not yet. Um, I just have that had that two classes, and then of course COVID hit last year when I had that second class, and I was really disappointed because we I canceled several sessions with them, and and I thought, gosh, you know, he's going to turn 11 years old, and he's going to you know he's going to lose all of this stuff, you know, and so finally I contacted their mother, and they they live about 15 miles from me, so I contacted their mother and. And uh, so we made arrangements to do, you know, finish up their classes via Zoom. And uh, then they needed just a couple more sessions, you know, out underneath the stars. And they, they, where they lived, they lived in a nice dark side. And I was willing to drive over to their home and, right. and do that. And so they didn't have to come over to my house. Great. And so we, we just stayed out there in their backyard. So we got a Facebook question here. Are there sample awards and can one order t-shirts or things like that as far as the program? Well, the the uh, the logo for the Sky Puppies, it's it is patent, so you can't make it, you know use that uh, image. Uh, but what I did, uh, I used uh, our club image, you know, so I could use that, and I just had the words Sky Puppy across their back, so I did not break any uh, copyright laws, and uh, so I just did that. And that this is the T-shirt that uh, I came up with for our club, uh, so cl our club members have this T-shirt. Uh, if they want. Right. And so I just thought they would enjoy having a t-shirt, you know, just something to have. And so when I just did that for the kids. So let's talk about the workbook just a moment. Uh, I think we may have mentioned this before, but just to restate it again. So let's say that 
you're a parent or maybe you're part of a scout troop or maybe just have a bunch of kids getting together, how do they get the workbook? Do they, do, does each one order the workbook or can they, one person order several workbooks? How does that work and where do they go to get that? Well, they they both, you can do it both ways. And I think you have a website that you can post on there into, yeah. into the chat pane, if yeah, you would please. I've actually already done that. I put out there the astronomical. Oh, workbook. I see it now. I see it. There you go. And uh, yeah, you could just go to that website and then up, up there at the top, you can, uh, there's a uh, observing programs, select that and then scroll down and you'll see the Sky Puppy program and they have them listed in alphabetical order. So it's easy to find. Yeah, so the, 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 yeah so act, the link the, I actually did was right there for the page exactly. itself, right? So that's it. Right, and then, then it opens up, uh, uh, you know, uh, information as far as what is required and it shows who the coordinator is. And then you can contact that coordinator via email and uh, just make a request on how many you would like. You can order one, you can order half a dozen or how many you need, right. and they'll be glad to send you some. And I think we should, we should also mention too, that if you're just a parent, let's not just a parent, but a parent, and you're looking to work with a library or the library is looking to do this program, we suggest that you actually go out and look at a, maybe an amateur club near you, an amateur astronomy club near you. If you go to the Astronomical League uh, page, which is the same page that we did the Sky Puppies program, you can find your club near you, at least in the U.S. It's a U.S.-based organization. And there's probably chances are you'll have a club somewhere near you. And uh, if nothing else, uh, you'd be surprised. Sometimes you can get folks to drive a bit of a distance to help you out to get some, give you some help there. So that's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, talk a little bit about, um, we, you and I were talking about this before we got started. I think scouts, maybe Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts have a version of this. And this, how does this program fit with, with, with that program? Well, there are some uh, activities that they are required to earn their little badges uh, for their uh, in their scout troops, and sometimes uh, doing the Sky Puppy program, you know, because they have to be able to identify a few constellations and understand that, and it, it would check off a few boxes of their earning their badges. So, what would you say the favorite part of this for the Sky Puppies for the children? Which is the part they really like the best? I think they really, I think they enjoyed it all. Um, cause when we were in the classroom, you know, I always really made it fun and entertaining and, and a learning experience and that these kids were just really eager to learn. Uh, because I, like I said, I did puzzles and games and, and videos of such all different kinds, you know, and, and I would actually, uh, uh, actually have them ask the question and have them answer it. So they would ask, answer their own questions on different things. And so I got, I would try to get them to use their own minds to to try to stimulate and so that because I knew they knew it they just didn't know they knew it <laughs> so what were the mythical stories what were some of the stories they were telling because that's always so much fun and it sounded like you did such a great job you told them one then made them tell it back right so what would right, be a good right. example my my favorite one is the talking about the uh, and it's at this time of the year too or in the fall I should say uh when uh, talking about Cepheus and uh uh, Cassiopeia and Andromeda and Pegasus and and uh, Perseus. It's a it's a and Cetus. And so it's a big long story about their you know jo uh, the, the kingdom of Jopa and how that's being attacked by this uh, sea monster Cetus. That uh, um, and so what they have to do and they have to uh, tie their daughter Andromeda to a rock and and try to save her you know so save the kingdom so. Cetus the monster is going to devour Andromeda and um, then Perseus, he's flying by on, on Pegasus and he sees what's going on. He goes, I can save your daughter if you'll just let me have her hand in marriage. And so he swoops down and, and, and uh, turns him to stone by showing him the head of Medusa that he just uh, uh, defeated uh, just a little while before that. And, uh, and so then they were, and, uh, they were married right on the spot. So it's, it, that was a really fun story. Yeah. Yeah. We did that one time. I got stuck on an inside program and we didn't have a lot going on. So we made up a play and we had our different characters be different parts of it. And oh. actually, actually, actually that, which is really kind of fun. So it looks like we're about ready to wrap up. I don't see any more questions coming through right now. Is there anything else you want to tell the viewers? And by the way, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And I do encourage you to join us next month when our librarians share their experiences as far as their library, how they approach it. So if you happen to be a uh, no librarian that may want to learn a little bit more about the library telescope program, we're in 44 plus states and, and several countries now, and we're continuing to grow. 
And uh, the best thing that you can do right now is spread the word about it. So any final thoughts, Gerilyn, that you have that, and by the way, it's such a great job and I thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoy doing this. Okay. Any, any final thoughts from you, I guess, before you sign off? Well, thank you. I'll just thank you for letting me do this presentation. Thank you for inviting me and I'm glad I was able to share this with you. Our, okay. Uh, so uh, tonight, uh, or probably tomorrow, I'll get this recording. And for those of you who uh, check out our YouTube channel, if you go to our librarytelescope.org page up the far top right, there'll be a YouTube button. Uh, I'll have that posted out there. And it's not just this program that will have recording. We have program recordings from various members on how to use the telescope from past programs we delivered. So I encourage you to take a look. And by the way, we're trying to get to 100 people on the YouTube. So if you can subscribe to that, would be appreciated. Once we get to 100, we can actually make a unique name that's a little bit easier to find right now than that long number up there. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. And we look forward to having you next month. Thank you.